Good day, I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. It's Monday, November the 21st, 2022. We've got CEO Dan Legault of Antibe Therapeutics joining us today. Antibe is a clinical stage biotech company with a proprietary hydrogen sulfide platform combating inflammation with lead drugs targeting pain and inflammatory bowel disease. I'm very glad to have Dan back with us. It's been one year almost to the day since we last spoke with Dan. While it's been a bit quiet on the news flow front, the company has been very busy moving its acute pain program, specialty pain program, and IBD program forward, as well as selling off its non-core cytogenics asset. Dan is going to give us an update and we'll dig into, into info on all three programs and what sort of news flow and milestones to expect for the coming 12 months. But please remember, this is neither recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Dan, thanks a lot for joining us today. And just to start off and as a refresher, why don't you uh, give us a quick overview or an elevator pitch on Antibes, its team, the assets, and then we'll dig into the various topics on a, a deeper level after that. Sure, Martin. It is a pleasure seeing you again. Love the, the, the new Tantan rocket over your shoulder there. That's great. Well, Antib is, is, uh, is a classic biotech. We're, we're headquartered in Toronto. This is our Toronto office where I am now. We're public on the uh, senior Toronto Stock Exchange. We're a classic drug development company. Very, very exciting. And of course, has risk as, as well. We have a fantastic uh, team of base scientists and, and clinicians all centered around the inflammation and pain space. We are uh, starting in the, uh, in the first half of the coming year, our third and final phase two uh, study, a large study, it will be a bunionectomy study. We are targeting the $25 billion acute pain market. It, so even though the pain market is the largest uh, market on the planet, and it's essentially essentially is the anti-inflammatory painkillers that we were involved in and the opioids, there's been precious little innovation and we are bringing brand new, truly innovative drugs uh, uh, drugs to this space. Following on uh, from that, we have drugs for inflammatory bowel disease and then additional painkillers um, as well. It's a very, very exciting uh, field and, and we are leveraging this hydrogen sulfide technology, this huge discovery that our founder and my former college roommate uh, has made um, where hydrogen sulfide is now understood to be the body's key manager of inflammation, as well as being um, important in cellular repair and cellular protection. So that's what we're leveraging. So you um, you recently reported your, your quarterly results and within that a lot of uh, updates, your lead um, uh, molecular program is the Otena Proxisul, which, um, You've reformulated now for acute pain after having some hiccups last year on the, the chronic pain side with some reformulations. Um, can you just give us an overview specifically on the Otena Proxisul and where you are on uh, acute pain uh, management with that? Sure. Uh, we, we're really happy with the progress we've made in the past, uh, in the past year. As you said, we were targeting chronic pain, osteoarthritis, the world needs painkillers that don't have um, that don't cause GI ulcers, stomach and and um, intestinal ulcers. It's a huge, well-known issue, and we have dramatic results in that. Along with all um, anti-inflammatory painkillers, we've been struggling with with some liver toxicity issues. Um, we're way less than Tylenol, though a bit more than than the current drugs. But it's clearly now um, a longer-term problem. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a, in a moment with you, Martin, but we've transitioned to acute. The acute, acute pain is a is a, also an attractive, very large market, a $25 billion market. It has the, essentially the same needs. It needs strong pain relief that is not um, that does not cause these, these ulcers and bleeding in the GI system. And that's exactly us. What yeah. we've done... Yep. Sorry, just to simplify it, just so make sure every, all the terms are acute pain is short term pain. Let's say you get a bunionectomy or there is a surgery or something happens and you, like for the next week or two, you've got this pain as something heals and then you take an acute pain care. Uh, well, chronic pain is whatever, a back or a 
some injury where then you're trying to manage pain for months and years on end. And the body obviously can tolerate and manage things differently on a short term versus a long term. Did uh, just to clarify the terms, did I get that kind of right? You got it very right. <laughs> very right. Acute means short term, chronic means uh, long term. So we were going for uh, chronic pain, huge needs, same needs in acute pain, no innovation. And our drug is perfectly matched for acute pain. And we are not seeing this toxicity issue at all. And we have a lot of confidence now in the past year that we won't see it. And I'll explain that um, as, as we go forward in this program, Martin. Um, and But we have a, a, there's a new requirement for acute pain, rapid onset of pain relief. In chronic pain, it's not really all that relevant. And so even though we have a tremendous amount of data, it's always starts at day four or so. In, a, in acute pain, you need to have pain relief within the first 60 minutes, meaningful pain relief. And uh, so um, so we have been working on a formulation for the past year. We have now switched to that formulation. It is markedly or dramatically is an appropriate word, more bioavailable. So it gets on board uh, much, much faster. And we've now um, made the transition to that. And we announced that about a month ago. The, the key, it's a new formulation based off of the prior drug. So it, it, it's essentially the same molecule, but I don't know, formulated and, and uh, mixed together with some other things. Uh, it, but essentially yeah. we're dealing with the same core drug. Absolutely, it's the same molecule. It is the same drug, um, but instead of being manufactured, so it has in, a, in crystalline form, um, like tiny, think of tiny microscopic salt crystals. Uh, it is, it is um, manufactured in a way that it is non-crystalline, so there aren't any crystals. It's called, the technical term is called amorphous. It, it's just there. And, and it's a relatively uh, well-known technique, although it's hard to do. And that's why it, it took us a while. Um, but we ha now have it um, well, well, and we've also um, been able to uh, manufacture it at scale. So that's uh, that problem has been solved now. That's why we have switched to it. So it's not crystal. So it, it just gets into the bloodstream so much faster. And what benefits so it gets into the bloodstream faster yeah and is does that do anything to help the the liver toxicity issue as well or, or what mechanisms of this new formulation make you believe that it's you're not going to have the same liver issues that you did with under the chronic uh circumstances well let me address that in two ways first of all about the formulation i mean the main objective was to get rapid onset, which we uh, have achieved, and we've now seen that in animals, and, and we go into uh, humans with this new formulation in the, in, the, in, um, in the first half of next year. It, 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 it unexpectedly had two additional benefits. Um, the, 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 um, <clears throat> the concentration of the drug stays high, which means that we can use much less of it. And it also dissipates more rapidly, which is which is also a safer and better. So unexpectedly, uh, the fact that we can use a, a much lower dose um, uh, for pain as we as, as you move on with your daily regimen, um, just by using less, we think it will be uh, safer. But that's not the primary reason why we have confidence uh, with liver toxicity, Martin. All of our uh, work and work of other scientists, it, it, you know, it's really gone a long way in the past uh, three years or so. It, it, your your investors may know that our investors may know that um, it, it's now known that every cell in our body makes hydrogen sulfide. It, I mean, it's quite fascinating. Hydrogen sulfide was known for 100 years as a poisonous gas, but at the individual molecule level, they act as signaling molecules, and they're the main a mediator or, or manager of inflammation and intimately um, involved in cellular repair and cellular protection. And these things are very, very, um, are, are, are very, very important. About two years or, or ago or so, scientists um, realized that the liver is also making its own hydrogen sulfide in the glutathione production cycle. And it uses uh, this hydrogen sulfide to help it, help it, it help it deal with various uh, toxicities that come from life and just come from things and come from anti-inflammatory painkillers, all of the painkillers, including ours. So it makes hydrogen sulfide um, on its own to help combat about that. 
it turns out that over the long term, starting about day 21 or, or after three weeks or so, our drug is slowing down the body, the liver's own production of its own hydrogen sulfide. I, I call it free lunch. <laughs> it's kind of fascinating. The liver is realizing it's getting this hydrogen sulfide and doesn't need to make as much of its own, but that causes problems over the longer term. Our, on the, so on, for acute usage, we just simply just don't have this problem. Uh, our, our acute Because you're be stopping it after three weeks before the body sort of adapts to it. So it's just a, a duration uh, issue. It, it, yes, it is completely a duration issue. Um, and our regimen will be five days. Uh, we, we will provide about seven days of pain relief, uh, which is, which is that, what, what doctors and surgeons really want, uh, is that for five to seven days of, um, of pain relief. And so we have a huge buffer th uh, there um, before the liver start we would even recognize that, uh, uh, that it's getting extra hydrogen sulfide. And it is quite nice. It's not a toxin. It, it, we're, we're giving a, a, a great thing that the, that uh, scientists now realize is, is used by the body to um, to um, provide protection against uh, these the, this this waste management thing. It's called reactive oxygen species. And, and then as well, given that you have higher bioavailability, then the pills you don't need as much how as many molecules call it in the in the pill itself. So. There's we less for the body has to process. And, yes, and it's, it's we, expect that that will, we expect that that will contribute to the liver safety as well. All right. Okay, so you are starting uh, your a phase two trial in the new year. Can That's you correct. tell us about that? Yes, we will probably proceed it by, um, um, by a human PK pharmacokinetic study because it will be the first time in humans that we are using this new formulation and we want to just see and just nail the, the pharmacokinetics. So we'll do a fast um, a human um, pharmacokinetic study in, in volunteers. And then Sorry, just to pause, pharmacokinetics, what is that for the layman? Sure, pharmacokinetics is, is essentially the this, this study or the measurement of how the active portions of your drug uh, course through the, through the bloodstream, really. Okay. And is that sort of on the, the safety side, just to understand um, what impacts it could have on safety or as well for efficacy? It's not so much for safety. We have so much uh, data all, all, already, and, um, and we're never going to go beyond ex an exposure level for all of the human data that we already have. It's to help us uh, determine the dosing regimen, really. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, uh, and then we'll follow that up with um, with a, quite a large uh, phase two dose ranging study, um, a bunionectomy study. Dose ranging is what you do in phase two to ascertain your dose for the phase three studies, and to get um, in, in acute pain to get and you get a broad acute pain label. Um, in the United States, it's it's now de rigueur. You essentially do two studies. Um, what's called a a, a um, hard tissue model, which is bunionectomy, and a soft tissue model, which is generally these days, um, but, uh, colloquially a tummy tuck operation. Both of them are very painful, but they are well, well characterized. Um, and so we're going to do our phase two uh, dose ranging study in bunionectomy, and, and then we'll repeat it in the phase threes. So we start that uh, in the first half of next year. Is there going to be a soft tissue um, one, a tummy tuck uh study or just the hard tissue? So we'll, we will finish our phase two with just the bunionectomy um, dose ranging study and uh, speak to the FDA for our phase three program. And then it, it's, it's pretty common that you do another bunionectomy and a tummy tuck. You need to do both two studies. For the phase three. three. That's correct. Okay. Okay. You also, um, in the news, you, you, um, we're uh, going to be doing a molar extraction, a dental uh, pain study, which you no longer need to do because of uh, your developments. Could you explain how and why that is? Yes. Um, so a molar as a study, um, getting your molars out is very painful. And, and as a result, it's quite a good surgical model to, to use when you're developing a, a drug. We were uh, planning on doing this with the with the previous formulation, um, and, and 
But since we wanted to uh, have more rapid onset in a lower dose, for the past year, in parallel, we've been working with this amorphous, this, this, uh, this other formulation. But, you know, just as being as just prudent people, you keep both programs going so you don't ever lose any time. On the, um, on the amorphous, the data that we had last uh, Christmas in animals was excellent. And so we went full um, bore on that program in parallel and including uh, all sorts of manufacturing studies as well. They, they show great promise and, and worked out very well uh, towards the end of, the, of this, just this past summer. And, uh, and we realized, boy, the, it's going to be so much better and the doses are going to be so much smaller than the, the, than the previous formulation. There's hardly any point in doing the molar study. We're not going to get much learning from it at all. We can make up that learning and, and not lose any time. We can make up that learning right in the bunionectomy and the PK studies. So we decided to switch. We, we, it took us about a three or four weeks to announce it because um, just because of, of patent filing. It, we filed a great patent on, with this amorphous formulation and patents have to be kept very secret until you actually file it. So, so, so as soon as we filed it, we, we put out a press release saying that we don't need to do the molar study and save the money. All right. I'm just curious, drug trials are notoriously difficult, or I don't know if notoriously, but I believe they are, where, um, because there's a big placebo effect, like, like, is when you do your trial, is your, are you going to be competing against Tylenol and other NSAIDs or against placebos or, or, or what hurdle do you have, typically do you have to, to pass when you're doing a, a, a drug trial on pain? Well, you always have to pass the placebo test. And in the United States, that's all you have to do is um, pass the placebo test. And that's hard. Um, so many pain drugs fail the placebo test. Placebo is a, just a huge phenomenon with, a, with, with human beings. We did a large 384 person placebo controlled study with the tenoproxisol uh, that was successful, showed very, um, really nice pain relief and, and, and big superiority over, or, over placebo, which is measured in, in um, p-values. We have a very low p-value uh, number. So we know we have a, a profound drug. And the phase threes will be placebo controlled. Uh, um, our, our, our upcoming bunionectomy, the, the dose ranging study, like almost all dose ranging studies in phase two won't be placebo controlled, but it will be multiple arms and multiple dose. So you can, you, you can draw the curves essentially to understand your, your, um, to understand your, your dose. Um, in Europe, you have to do placebo control studies, um, but you also have to uh, use a comparator and, and generally go for non-inferiority. Um, and so we'll, 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 we'll do that. And that doesn't, um, that's, you know, historically when we measure our data to historical data of all NSAIDs um, or, or, or our, our large 384 person study showed us that awfully nice, strong pain relief. So we'll, we will choose a, a, a well-known, strong competitor when we do do a, um, a, a non-inferiority study. You're still planning and mapping out the, 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 the phase two for next year. And you said it's going to be a large study. Can you give us, or are you able to give us any, like how long these are going to take? It's acute pain. So obviously patients in and out relatively quickly, I would, would guess. Um, can you give us any guidance on how big is big and maybe how long it would take to complete the study? Sure. So uh, our preliminary um, design now is for a form, forearm uh, study with about 40 people in arm. Uh, that will give us enough statistical power to, to uh, draw the dose response curves. <clears throat> we, we are likely going to use a loading dose, a maintenance dose, and a tapering dose over a five-day regimen. Kind of exciting. So we'll be tapering off as, as your pain is, is decreasing, giving a, a bunch up front because that's when you really want it. Um, and so, so we're going to probably do four arms just to give us a, a better, just more data to draw those uh, curves from which to select the doses for the, for the phase three study. All right. Um, it's, it's five days of treatment. Um, they're, they're relatively easy to recruit for uh, in the United States. Bunionectomy is, is a real thing. Yeah. You mentioned your patent that you, uh, you waited to announce the, the, um, the molar thing to get your patents down. 
could you talk about the the intellectual property the the barriers you have there obviously i believe it's uh you're extended out to 2040 um if i remember correctly on that can you just talk about the ip and what that really means sure so um so market protection uh, essentially a government enforced monopoly is how the whole world pays for its drugs that's the yeah. whole uh, pharmaceutical industry and it's all based upon patents generally speaking uh, patent life is not really long enough and so all modern jurisdictions including Canada and the United States have tended to extend that with with data exclusivity laws so so it so it's complex and, and they work hand in hand and smart smarter companies constantly try to refresh their patents and, and come up with new ones and, and erect a bit of a wall um, and because you're essentially trying to prevent the generics from coming in um, until you know you fairly have recouped your money and the investors have made an appropriate return for the risk that they're uh, that they're running so we I'm very um, proud of and just love our, our our patent lawyers we have a whole series of them in Canada and the, in, in the United States all all working they're all coming up the day before our Christmas party for a four-hour brainstorm here in, in Toronto. Um, um, we, we expect um, that our patents, that the the, um, the new patent that we just um, filed in, in October will be, a, uh, will be a strong patent. It was not easy to come up with this, uh, with this formulation and, um, and it will be, and it, it will, and, um, you know, any company would, we we imagine any generic company would have to use this formulation so we think it'll be a strong patent but patents you never know until you get sued and you <laughs> and you defend your your patent um uh it's it, it's a it's a complex business and so you try to have a whole series of strong patents and that's exactly what we're doing we have one of the finest us um, um, patent um, creation teams and in canada all working in concert for this does the the patent uh, apply specifically to the Otena Proxisul, or is it more on the whole platform? It, it can be applied to maybe some of your other drugs you you develop. The the, um, the recent patent from a month ago is uh, exclusively for Otena Proxisul. Um, a year ago, we we filed another patent for Otena Proxisul. Uh, that 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 regime of loading, uh, maintenance, and tapering doses as as well well of course we have our our, our main composition of matter um, patent um uh as well that is on atenoproxyl and 30 other um uh sister drugs all right um and i think we've hit the high points is there anything we we've missed on uh, the atenoproxyl program that we should bring up before we move the the, the conversation forward well we we did uh, recently uh, complete a um, it, what we thought was very well done um, commercial market assessment. We use one of the well-known third-party strategy consultancies um, that do very rigorous, robust work. Their reputation is more important than the, the little project that we're giving them. So they're, they are well-known. And, um, and, and this helps us uh, understand the potential, but it also helps us um, in, in our partnering efforts, which will start again uh, next summer. Um, it, we were we were pleased with those results. It involved a whole series of focus groups with American uh, doctors, various types, um, emergency room doctors, orthopedic surgeons, general uh, surgeons, uh, e even some family doctors. Um, the, the, the switching rates, and because there isn't much out there, it's, it's all standard 25 year old anti-inflammatory drugs or opioids and opioids they're trying not to do. So uh, they were excited uh, by it, and the switching rates um, were quite, quite nice, uh, showing, um, th th and, and so they uh, thought that a, a likely peak sales projection would be for the United States alone, and for just a, a, a few indications, including post-operative pain, which is the most important one, um, would be uh, likely in the in the billion dollar range just for the United States. The United States is about 40% of the world market. So we were very pleased with that. Um, so that's I think is is important. We'll, we'll start our our marketing, um, uh, our, I mean our partnering uh, efforts again as we uh, as we approach the data for the for the phase two uh, next summer. Um, I think that's uh, those are important. And sorry, back on the market study, is the primary driver why you would grab market share? It would it be essentially the GI issues which a lot of NSAIDs cause, or are there or just the general 
ability to diminish pain or, or what other are the positive relative attributes compared to the other uh, NSAIDs or, or pain drugs out there? I mean, that's a great question. So uh, there's been very little innovation. Uh, there has been injections for operations um, right at the site. These, these, uh, the so-called LALAs, uh, you, you know, the, the locally acting long lasting things, but we're complementary to that. Essentially when you wake up in the recovery room, um, you are either given a 25 year old NSAID or an opioid. And so no wonder doctors are looking for new ones. Uh, the opioids hardly need any um, explanation. Uh, we're, we, we, we imagine that we, we, and we're considering doing a non-inferiority to an opioid. We, we're going to be one of the strongest and then we're shooting to be one of the strongest NSAIDs, which are on the whole fantastic drugs, but they have problems. So we're going to be at the high end of pain effectiveness. Um, GI safety is the number one issue, and it's a short-term thing as well as a, as a long-term thing. We've shown that uh, in numerous other studies have, have shown how serious uh, this, this issue is. And uh, we're built around a backbone of naproxen, which is generally regarded as the most cardiovascular benign of all of the, um, of the anti-inflammatory painkillers. And our hydrogen sulfide even um, aids, adds to that. So uh, and, and then the other lesser known side effects, such as kidneys, uh, where we're all m much the same. So we want to be the NSAID of, of choice by being super strong, but g uh, fully GI safe and uh, no cardiovascular issues, or at least we're built on, 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 on we're improving upon naproxen, already the best one. Would you expect the, the drug to be an OTC drug or a prescription drug? Well, definitely prescription uh, first, and that's what we're going for, and that could be extremely lucrative. But uh, with with the lengthy patent life um, and the fact that this drug would be used by hundreds of millions of people, um, we, we would, uh, upon approval, we would embark upon a, a program to bring it OTC. It, it, it's a nice OTC candidate as well. All right. Um, <clears throat> on on the pain side as well, you do, you there is some discussion and notes in your your news on the, your specialty pain program. Can you give us a quick update on where that's at and and what we should expect uh, news wise coming from there? Sure. So there's all, all kinds of um, generally inflammation based conditions that lead to a tremendous amount of, of, of pain and uh, this, this specialty uh, one, because we're still um, in, the, in the intellectual property stage and that's why we're being a bit cagey with it. But uh, um, uh, there, there is um, uh, a particularly important indication that is quite, quite lucrative. It's been very, there's hardly any good medicines for that. And so our ATP352 has shown really nice data in animal models of that type of, um, of specific pain. Um, at the moment, we are now uh, doing studies or about to start a study contrasting our otanoproxazole together with ATB352 to see if otanoproxazole is, um, fares as well or better or, or almost as well. Um, and, and we'll, depending upon the, those results, we may just seek, seek a, um, a, an expansion of the label at that time for a tanaproxisol and, and essentially save the money on the development of another drug. So we're 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 um, tanaproxisol is quite a beautiful drug. So we're we're, we're going to explore uh, that specialty pain indication in, in animal models um, coming up in January. Okay, so a tanaproxisol may replace your uh, ATP. Sorry, I forget the number. Um, as the to the to target that indication that as well. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um. So let, let's discuss inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. Uh, where is your hydrogen sulfide platform? Uh, how, how is the target of IBD going uh, for that? It's going very well and it's very exciting. And it's something that we know a lot about. Um, um, many of our scientific advisors are, are, are well known for their, for their knowledge in this area, either as scientists or as a, or as a gastroenterologist. Um, as a matter of fact, and back in 2007, our lead drug at the time was uh, a drug called ATB429 for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, um, and uh, and um, I was traveling in the United States, received some uh, really nice term sheets for big money from well-known, very large, well-known American um, venture capital companies. And we didn't get the deal closed before um, Lehman Brothers fell. And, and then we decided to 
um, to focus on our pain, which is an even larger program. But we've never lost sight of inflammatory bowel disease. But we uh, we felt that the intellectual property remaining runway, remaining lifetime for that patent wasn't strong enough to merit development. So we rolled up our sleeves to create a new version of it, but with completely fresh IP, like a new molecule. And, and we now have three candidates. Um, we'll choose one by Christmas time. And, uh, and all the three candidates are showing more or less in animal work um, e equivalency or, 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 or so, or slightly better. It was a lovely drug, um, uh, 2ATB429. These drugs are themselves hydrogen sulfide releasing versions of mesalamine. So 90% of people uh, with colitis, for example, a, a, one of the two key forms of inflammatory bowel disease, are first prescribed mesalamine around the world. Mesalamine is a good drug, but it's not particularly strong or, or effective. Um, and uh, people will, will, may know the words Remicade or Humira or so, these biologics that are used for serious, um, the most severe forms of inflammatory bowel disease. These biologics are very expensive and a real miserable side effects. So our view all along is let's make mesalamine more effective. And so not only good for mild uh, IBD, but also moderate IBD. And so that's our, our strategy. Um, uh, we now have three nice candidates and we'll choose, a, uh, we'll choose one and, along with the backup in the next six weeks or so. So you announce uh, your lead candidate by the end of the year. What does 2023 look like in terms of news flow for your uh, lead candidate? What what kind of news and progress would one expect you to get make over that time? Well, uh, well we're we're um, we're going to then launch onto the, the classic um, uh, I, I, IND enabling studies, which means this the regulated studies. There's about 30 of them that you need to do in animals and in the laboratory before you can uh, do uh, an actual study in human before your first in human study. So we're going to um, um, be moving our, our, our IBD drug and as a matter of fact, another drug uh, through the IND enabling pipeline. And we're also though, uh, keeping a close eye on our money, as you uh, mentioned, it's a, uh, um, or, our, <laughs> um, or as you know, it's a pretty uh, uh, horrendous time out there in the biotech uh, stock markets and in the capital markets. And we're lucky that we have $45 million of cash. And so the bulk of that is, is uh, we're very uh, um, careful with that. And the bulk of that is for, of course, our, our lead program at Tenaproxys. And the IND studies, would that be like a six, a nine, a 12 month sort of timeline, just ballpark? It's, it, it's usually a 10 to 18 month um, okay. uh, timeline. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. All right. Um, well, you mentioned your $45 million you guys have on hand uh, at the end of last quarter that you, you just released. It's a lot of money, but in the world of biotech, you can use that pretty quickly. Um, how far does that take you or to what milestones uh, can can you reach uh, with, with that those $45 million? Right. Well, we can go a long, uh, we can go a long way. We, 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 we are, uh, are sort of... Uh, saying that we have um, nicely in excess of two years of runway, which is really nice for a biotech company. Um, we put a lot of money in the bank with our Chinese partnering deal and our last fundraise. Um, it's almost two years ago now, um, and put a lot of money in the bank. And at that time we said we had um, uh, over two years of <laughs> runway left and we're still saying it. So we're very careful with our money. Um, acute trials are, 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 are uh, are obviously much less expensive than than uh, chronic trials. Um, um, we're not exactly sure what the FDA will want us to do for our phase threes in terms of the number of people. So, uh, so we so we're we're we are being conservative in, in our forecasts. This will take us, you know, two years past our our well, about two years past our partnering um, point. So we can get well past our first. Uh, our first phase three study, which would, which, uh, which, which clearly showed the value in our drug. So, okay. So roughly two years of runway from today and, and, um, when, like, if things go reasonably well, what would be a reasonable time to expect, let's say the start of a phase three study, could that you squeeze that start in into 2023 or would that be more of a 2024 event? 
it's more of a 2024 event, first half of 2024. We could squeeze it into 2023, but we would prefer, as, as most um, biotechs trying to do a blockbuster drug, we would all prefer, and we're going to do that, do request and have an end of phase two meeting with the FDA where you discuss your phase three program. It's not mandatory, but it's it's a judicious thing to do. And, and, and that takes a certain amount of time, about three, four months to uh, to, to do. So um, so in the first, well, we will start in the you know late winter, early spring, uh, perhaps, depending on the, the FDA timeline, um, we will start our, our first phase three study. And then we will, in a staggered start, do our second phase three. So, so, uh, so for, uh, so they will be uh, um, going on in parallel. All right. Um, that is a two year runway is, uh, quite excellent. Um, yeah, uh, I think I, I'm being a bit conservative when I say two years, but, uh, probably better to be that way than we're just yeah. being very judicious with our money because it's an unprecedented time out there. Yeah. It, especially the biotechs is ugly out there. Um, is that, um, I don't know, does that create problems or maybe opportunities when there are other companies that maybe have some IP that you could maybe acquire or are companies more thirsty for a partner at this point um, or less thirsty because they're they're waiting it out to, to see who's really struggling and they can get better terms on a, a partnership deal? How, how does the macro environment uh, affect Antib and its uh, strategy? It's a complicated world, and you need to be particularly um, judicious. Uh, you, you said a number of things there that are quite interesting. Um, we did um, engage a firm to scour the world for small mo molecules um, in development for inflammatory conditions, um, and uh, there aren't a whole lot. Um, and after looking at them all, we we like our own approach, where we take a molecule of our own design that releases hydrogen sulfide, and we molecularly attach it to uh, to a, a current standard of care drug that we can make a whole lot better. We get a brand new patent, and uh, and uh, and get a much better drug. So uh, so and we've been making candidates not only for inflammatory bowel disease, but also um, a, a a super strong painkiller uh, that could also have an IV. Um, um, formulation as well. So we're, we're showing internally that we know how to do this and we're making progress on that. So we're going to continue on on that while being judicious with our money. We do get phone calls almost on a weekly basis of bi biotechs who want to merge with us. Essentially, they, uh, they have very little ways of getting financing. And, and although our hearts go out to them, uh, usually it's not uh, really what we, what we want to do. Um, you don't want to get married for your money. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, uh, and so we, we know how to create new drugs. We have uh, uh, two in the pipeline, inflammatory bowel disease and a super strong painkiller as well. And of course, atanaproxyl, which is uh, really exciting. I mean, there's, I mean, I say this in all sincerity, Martin, we all feel internally that we've never been at a less risky point in our existence, uh, mostly because we, we really understand uh, the liver issues now and, and have a fair amount of comfort that we're not going to going to see them in an acute context. So that makes it very, very exciting for us. And we know we have a, a, a powerful and, and GI safe drug. So, um, so that, that, that's exciting. We're going as, as fast as we can, uh, albeit um, we do very rigorous work. We have fantastic teams and, and all sorts of outside experts as well, but we sort of, you know, they, they become part of our company. They come to our Christmas party. It's that, that sort of thing. So we're we're going um, we're we're going quickly, uh, and, and so we're a bit insulated from from the vagaries of, of the stock market. We should have bunion results um, in the second half of the, the year. That will be a major major inflection point for us. So it, it should be a value inflection point for us. Um, so we just stick to our knitting. knitting. Uh, next summer we'll start our partnering efforts. Again, uh, again um, we know who the the the. It's it's easier to target to to um, partner an acute drug than it is a chronic drug, and we've had su su success already partnering chronic drugs. So, and we know who the universe is of about eighty companies or so that we're really going to go and and begin conversations with. So, um, our money can take us so much farther than that uh, partnering point. Um, you know, another two years past that point or so. So we feel as if we're in a good uh, in a good place.
All right, we're going to switch over to the audience uh, Q&A here. Um, and uh, first question, here's your uh, MDNA, your management discussion and analysis says, you are still investigating a potential path forward for autenaproxasul, chronic. It also states that the new formulation allows for a lower dose. Any chance the new formulation could resolve the issues with the elevated liver enzymes? For chronic patients, um, yes, we, we will. We will really understand the, the this new formulation and the lower dose levels in, in our upcoming human studies in the first half of uh, of next year, and that will give us uh, an indication on that. We are also um, have made a lot of progress on regimen discovery. Uh, we are working with um, for four years now with a, a group of liver scientists in the United States that are extremely respected. Um, uh, for their work with uh, with liver issues and drug development, and they're very respected by the FDA, and, and they're the ones that have helped us uh, figure out the free lunch uh, theory. Um, so, so it's not, it's not only the lower dose with the formulation; it's also regimen. And our drug has, is particularly powerful in longer lack, a, a, acting. So, we can a loading dose can go a long way. So, by an appropriate regimen. Um, um, we can. We think that we will be able to address chronic um, by by not um, letting the liver to uh, not allowing the liver to depend upon our hydrogen. So, just keeping it confused about that. There could be uh, there could be a, a vacation period or a series of times where there's very low dose or or, or, or a non dose. We won't we won't actually need, need it likely for chronic pain or uh, whatever through um, in, intelligent. Regimen design, we think we're going to be able to nicely attack um, uh, chronic. I do want to emphasize how <laughs> how lovely and large the uh, the acute um, market is as well. But nonetheless, we're very keen on on using all of the acute knowledge and replicating that uh, for chronic. So you, the data you get out of the next year's acute program, you're get, there's going to be uh, pieces from that that you'll be able to apply to the chronic. Uh, plan is there or is it at any point where you could start talking about some milestones or at, by the end of 2023 maybe have some news out on on a chronic program or it's just focused on the acute and when something emerges for chronic that'll come out then well we're working on both at the same time but the, the path to chronic really is 100 percent through acute nail an acute regimen really understand what that is doing uh, with the with the liver, and then use that knowledge to to design the regimens that we're going to need for for chronic. There will be additional benefit, as we discussed, from from this amorphous formulation, and that we need to uh, learn um, in 2023. So I, I think by the end of 2023, we're going to be able to publish um, a development um, a path for chronic. So, and chronic could use the exact same formulation just on a different dosing regime or schedule and use the same drug in, in a different way, call it, for both acute and for chronic? Absolutely. It would be the same formulation and the same, and the same drug, just in an, albeit in a different um, regimen. All right. Okay, great. Um, on to the next question here. Will the distribution agreement in China apply to the new acute focus or was it limited to chronic only? It will apply to the, the new acute focus as well. Um, there were some uh, you know, there is some vagueness in the in the agreement. The agreement is filed on CDAR with, with respect to that because at, at the time we were all thinking uh, cr chronic, but um, um, but we we think they know how to sell drugs and so we are going to uh, so we're so we'll, we'll clear up that confusion in any event we're keen on them having uh, having the the acute um, uh, delivery rights all right uh there are several questions regarding your share price and the market and so forth so i'm going to wrap them all in together uh someone commenting about how much your share price is down, any plans to promote the stock and any thoughts and timing regarding a, a NASDAQ uplisting? Sure. So uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're amazed and surprised at, at the, um, at our stock price. Uh, we have so much cash and we're, and we have 8,000 
person days on a tenoproxyl, 700 people uh, for multiple uh, days, um, where we, we think we're at the lowest r r risk. Of course, it's biotech, so it's always risky, um, but, um, but, but we have a strong handle on the, on the liver issues now. Um, and just uh, to highlight, you're trading well below cash here, aren't you? Yeah, yeah we're trading well below cash. Um, um, I, I bought stock again myself last week, so, so did my team. Um, um, but, you know, it's hardly limited. You know, there's some 200 uh, companies trading below cash in North America. So it's, it's just a very a challenging time out there. Uh, starting with JP Morgan, uh, we're going to, we, we now, now that we're on this new formulation and, and we have, uh, and we have our whole plan ahead of us, we are, um, we are going to start, um, um, revisiting, um, in, in, in the institutional investors in the United States, as well as the retail investors in the United States. And we have a, always a strong program in Canada. All right. Um, next question. It sounds like the pharmacokinetic study would be quick. Do you have a sense of the duration? It'll be five days of, of dosing. All our studies will be five days of dosing going forward. Um, the, the, the <laughs> next week in, in we are, uh, everyone's flying in, uh, to Toronto here to this office here um, and we will finalize the um, the design of that study um, it's conceivable that we can um, uh, that everyone can be dosed uh, in one day or otherwise it would take um, two weeks and so then just five days later uh, we, we we would start getting results um, it, it, it might have to be dosed in in two rounds but these are uh, paid volunteers so it's very very fast it's very very fast to, to do and we don't need the a full-on study report. We just need the data uh, to move forward again. So, so uh, you know, from start to finish, before we're moving on with uh, with our bunionectomy, it's it, it's like two and a half months or so. All right. And, and would results from that be published? Like, would that that get a news release, or is it just incorporated and then on to now we're 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 starting the bunionectomy study? Well, well, we'll we'll keep uh, the market apprised um, um, about that study, but the the data would be far too detailed for um, for your average investor. It's I mean, it's real, it's, it's real blood connect data. Okay, yeah. all right. Are you able to comment on prospective dosage for the lowest and highest of the four arms for P two bunion? No, but the animal data is is showing um, several fold uh, better bioavailability than the than the formulation that we just switched from, um, and and we have all the data we need to do the the mathematical prediction of what we should use in the bunion in humans. But the reason why we want to do the PK study is is just to ensure that the human metabolism curves are are, are are truly, um, you know, you can follow, you can use them, the animal math to, to do it. So, so um, the, the, it's a very scientific sort of study. The, the likely doses will be many times less than, than what we were expecting before, several times, like two or three or four fold uh, less is sort of, it's, it's going to be in that range. All right. And, and I not, and, and I guess that indicates improved margins potentially then uh, once it gets approved and so forth, just less drug to administer uh, for uh, resulting uh, pain relief. Well, that won't really play into it that that much. I mean, yeah. new, new drugs have margins in the 96% uh, range. So whether it's 95 or, or, or so, is it, um, that, that won't really be a big yeah. factor in our evaluation. And you you did comment that you're working with a drug manufacturing partner. So the risk of production and so forth, you you highlighted earlier, you you feel like hopefully when you get past the uh, you get the approval stage, it, it's an, a readily manufacturable and and producible drug. It is. Um, but producing drugs is extremely complicated. Um, and, you know, almost half of our i n d filing, fifty five thousand pages, half of it, was just on chemistry, um, uh, just on drug manufacturing and chemistry. It's a very, very uh, complex area, and things, particularly when you go to scale, uh, can 
you know, you can have all sorts of problems. So we are dealing with Lanza. We've been working with Lanza now for three years, well-known global Swiss company. They've been fantastic. Um, and, um, and our process chemist and our main regulatory person um, for CMC um, are, are, are tremendous. But it's very high up on, on, on my radar screen. It's At the moment, it is now our number one um, risk, whereas before it was always liver issues. Now this is just to make sure, because we're getting, just today, in an internal meeting, we're looking at timelines for our NDA, for our actual filing our approval, because you need you need um, a year's worth of stability and you you have to have had multiple batches of pills and multiple batches of powder. Um, and, and all this has, when it's human quality at scale, uh, extremely complex and has to be very well done, it takes time. Um, so, um, but there's nothing wildly complicated about making a tanaproxisol. Uh, uses common starting ingredients, um, and, uh, and 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 our manufacturer is a, just a very well known and very respected uh, global Swiss company. All right, and have you have the pills been manufactured to date? Have we? Uh, there has been production runs of it. Well, we, well, we've been in. in we've had eight thousand person days of a tanaproxisol, uh, and 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 seven hundred people. Over multiple days, so but with the formulation, but but with this new formulation, um, uh, it's we we it's been in animals, um, and it's in animals as we speak, and and so we have pills, but you you need a GMP material, which stands for good manufacturing um, process um, or good manufacturing practice, um, and uh, there's a lot of extra work going on in that, and so. Uh, so the PK study is waiting for the um, the the critical path is actually uh, getting our, our our human quality pills, which won't come until March. Okay. So so the human quality pills won't come until March, and is that when you expect to then start the uh, that that's the critical path forward you were mentioning? Is you can't that, 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 start the study until those pills get shipped. That's correct. Yeah, okay. that's correct. So, so that's the the critical path, meaning the the, the thing that is controlling the timeline. Yeah. Um, we, we, we internally will will fin finalize our design for that study uh, next week, um, and then then go off and line up all of the. We, we know the we know the likely people, the companies at the, in the United States who will conduct the studies, but um, um, but we'll then start to formally uh, contract them, so we're all ready to go. Um, as we wait for the pills. All right, two uh, questions uh, left Left here. Um, one question from, uh, I'm guessing a, a frustrated uh, shareholder uh, stating, what's the analyst activity happening in terms of coverage and why is there such a disconnect between consensus target price and uh, current stock price? Well, uh, that is a that is a great question, and I don't know if I have uh, the perfect answer. Of, of course, I think that um, most analysts think that we're uh, very undervalued, um, and uh, and but they're saying that about other companies as well. The stock market is just horrendous. Uh, um, it, it's just horrendous out there, um, uh, and. Uh, um, so, so analysts have a hard, hard time trying to convince, um, <laughs> trying to convince people, um, uh, you know, like, like, like in anything, I think that people should just try to really understand the potential and the risks. Uh, um, and, and then, and for us, it's not all that hard to do um, uh, because, it, well, it's, it's not that hard to understand the potential of our drug, um, that to understand the risks, um, uh, I mean, of course, that's always harder. You have, you have, I'm, we're always open. Any one of uh, people uh, who are watching are always, um, I, I welcome their emails or even phone calls um, and, and we'll give them whatever color I can within the context of the uh, of the securities laws. But um, um, we're pretty thinly traded too. And, and most, it is a hard time in the capital markets. Um, and But I think our stock can change quite, quite quickly as, as people start to realize, oh my gosh, this is way undervalued. 
All right. And um, final question here is, what do you think, uh, what's the biggest risk for, um, for the company's success with the uh, P2 phase two and phase three for Otena Proxisul? Is it the effectiveness of pain relief, liver enzymes, or other issues? What, what, what do you think could be the, what are you most concerned about as it goes through the trials here? So, so that's a that, that's a great question. Um, uh, before it was always our um, our our, our uh, liver issues. That is much less so. But let me let me start again. Essentially, we have to show uh, we we have a little diagram. It's, it looks like a triangle, and we have to be inside the triangle. We have to be a strong, uh, effective um, at, with pain relief. We have to be liver safe, and we have to have a, a, a sixty minute. Uh, onset of action to meaningful pain relief. The word is meaningful. Um, so that's where we're, we're very focused on. Um, and any risks that we can enumerate, we're all over. I mean, it's 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 a bit the risk of the unknown. Anything could happen. This is drug development. It's a very, very risky business. I mean, I mean when we first had liver issues, we had never seen it in animals. It, 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 um, and um, we never, and to this day, we still don't see it in animals. So so it, 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 it is a complicated uh, thing I, I'm much less concerned about uh, liver now that I see all the data and all the work for the past four years and, and see that it's re really it seems to be a, 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 an issue that only happens in people with compromised uh, livers they already have some liver issues and only uh, after um, uh, you know it was day 28 when we when we would see it it would yeah. always, always happen later so sorry. And, and, was, was yeah, there sorry. any uh, of the liver issues, anything popping up within five or 10 days in with uh, last year's trial? Or as you were saying, it only happened after three, four weeks. There, there, there were none uh, er, early on and there never have, there have never been any. It's always been on a, on a 28 day trial. There was lower doses. It was on day 28 on the 14 day trials. It was on day 24. You finished taking your drug. But ten days later, you come back for more blood tests, and 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 in, and in the, about the eight percent of people that we were having these, it, it was only happened then. So it really is a longer term um, um, I I issue, um, and, uh, um, and 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 then we have all the data and now the understanding to to sort of show that. So it, it, it of course we're it, it's a risk in being a biotech CEO. You you hardly you worry about everything. Um, so. But but um, all of the risks on getting inside of that triangle, um, uh, we we feel we have a, a really nice handle on, including now rapid onset with this new formulation. So um, and that's why we, we primarily um, we, we developed and, that, and that's why we say with some confidence that we feel as if we are uh, have less risk than than ever. But it is biotech, and and of course, and we've had two near death experiences: one 15 months ago, and one. Uh, seven or eight years ago um the one seven or eight years ago uh, people who bought you know they our stock went up nine or uh, 10x um in, in, you know once we publish results and so we hope to do, uh, and expect that we're going to do that again all right well on that note dan thanks a lot uh that was very informative tons of information um and uh enjoyable so thanks a lot and uh, we're looking forward to seeing the news flow in the, the coming year great martin i really enjoyed it myself Cheers. Cheers.